Please be seated. You're probably familiar with that old phrase. Let's see if we can make this work. You're probably familiar with that old phrase, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never harm me, or, or equivalents of that. I know that I was certainly taught that as a child. Uh, I don't know if you know, though, that the first time that appeared in print was in 1862 in a church publication by the African, American, the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Right in the middle, it's not going to work, is it? <laughs> Right in the middle of, I'll talk loudly. Right in the middle of the Civil War. And it was there for a reason. It was because that church, and a lot of churches that served especially African American populations, were facing intense criticism and real hate speech and threats from all sides, north and south. And it was a way of bolstering the parishioners, of, of, of bolstering the faithful, saying, you know, stand strong. Let them yell at you. Yet let them scream. But I suspect you know, and I think they knew then, a truth about that. And that is that the words do cause harm. That they have that power to hurt and in fact, to hurt more deeply than the sticks and stones. We know that words have incredible power. Just think about last week's Old Testament from Genesis. God spoke the world into being. God spoke the light into being. God spoke us into being. The psalm today it says, not a word escapes from my lips, but you know it, O oh God. Or something like that. Yeah. Jesus is the word. There is power in words. How's that old phrase go? The pen is mightier than the sword. Even today we say that. Words have power. And we know that they have power for good and for ill. We also know that it's a dangerous thing. And we know that sometimes when we speak, it is to our own danger. Last week I was talking to you about that whole terrorist attack in France you know, against that, that magazine, uh, Charlie Hebdo. And you know how that went, right? You know, over the last few weeks, not only were those, those people killed, the artists, the writers, police officers were killed in this, this horrible, horrendous attack. And the reason for the attack, the stated reason for the attack, was because the magazine has, which is a, a really sort of a, a weekly newspaper, I think. But it has this tendency to publish inflammatory stuff all the time. Essentially, it's a newspaper that hates everybody. They have written a lot of things about Christians, about Jews, about anybody else, because they just hate everybody pretty much. But they have, in recent years, a particular uh, dislike for Muslims, and the way that they could show the greatest contempt was by publishing images of Muhammad, which is, of course, uh, just the worst you can imagine, at least, for a Muslim. You can't do that for them. So they do it. It's like poking a stick in the eye. The attack has no excuse. And in the aftermath of that attack, French people from all over that nation and people from all over the world took up a slogan Je suis Charlie, I am Charlie, which is a way of standing up in solidarity for freedom of speech, no matter how vile it might seem. And it makes sense to stand up for freedom of speech. 
No one should ever fear for their freedom, for their families, or for their lives based on what they say, based on the ideas that they're putting forward. And yet, and I should say that, that their very next publication, which had a picture of Muhammad on the cover, sold over five million copies. This for a publication that averages about 60,000 issues. They had to keep reprinting it. And yet, after that, there have been some voices saying, are we sure about this? One of the most prominent voices was Pope Francis, who recently said, absolutely, we have the freedom to speak, and we should and we must have the freedom to speak. But do we not also have some responsibility for how we use our words? He was attacked fairly, fairly vociferously for blaming the victim for this. But I wonder, is that what he was saying, first of all? And is that how we are to think about it? Let's look at the Apostle Paul for just a moment. In his letter to the Corinthians, what does he say? He says, all things are lawful for me. But not all things are beneficial. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by them. What is he getting at there? Well, to understand this, we have to understand Paul a little bit. In the past months, the uh, uh, Bible study, the weekly Bible study, has been going over the book of Romans, and we have dis discovered something about Paul. Paul is an eminently practical person in a lot of ways. This is a guy, of course, who gets constantly beat up and thrown in prison, but when it comes to the churches he founds, he's eminently practical. And his primary rule is, be a good citizen and do not rock the boat. Don't get the outsiders mad at you. The reason for this, of course, is because the Christian church at the time was so fragile, so very delicate in a sense, and always on the verge of total collapse. So Paul is all about getting along with everybody who's not a Christian. Be a good citizen. Obey the authorities. And he says in various letters things to that effect. He says, if your right to speak causes trouble, then hold in your tongue. Hold your tongue. He uses this with women. In certain uh, Christian communities, they understood Christ's acceptance of women, Mary and Martha, for example, to mean that women had equality with men and therefore ought to hold positions of authority. Paul doesn't really dispute this, but what he says is, look at what it's doing to the communities around you. Everybody hates you because of this. Because, of course, in those communities, women did not have rights. So he commanded the women in those communities to stand down. Or look what happened with eating food offered to idols. Where Christians were like, it's just food. Those idols are nothing. We should be able to eat the food. And Paul says, yeah, you're right. But if it offends your host, why offend unnecessarily? Just don't eat it. And in his letter to the Corinthians today, other communities understood that what Christ was saying, the freedoms that Christ gave were so broad that they understood it to also be sexual freedom. And Paul says, yeah, all things are lawful, but that's not helping very much. Your carousing is not helping the church. It's not helping bring people closer to God. It's driving people away. In, in Paul's view of Christianity, his approach almost necessarily requires us to willingly rein in freedoms that Christ has given us. All things are lawful, sure, but is it helpful? 
And if, it, if that's the case in those situations, how much more so when it comes to harmful speech, to intentionally insulting, to intentionally verbally abusing others? Yeah, it's allowed. God is not going to throw you out of the family for doing it. But is it helpful? Is it going to bring others closer to Christ? Is it going to bring the kingdom of God closer to us? And what Paul says is, that's not helping. It is bringing others further and further away from the very thing that has given us life. Is that your intention? Is it your intention to belittle others so that they no longer trust or love God? Is it your intention to make them so small, to make them feel so small that they explode with hatred? Is it your intention to make them feel and to know that they are worthless? Because sometimes we do an awfully good job of that. And Paul says, you have that freedom. Are you willing to let go of that freedom for the sake of the kingdom of God? Which is a very hard pill to swallow. Because what that means so often is that others, others get to yell at us. Others who are too sensitive they can say whatever they want, and we can't snap back at them. We don't get to talk back. Well, if you know anything about Paul, first of all, he was not exactly a guy who held his tongue all the time. But in those instances, he did. This does not mean that we have to be quiet all the time. Look at our gospel for just a minute. You've got this wonderful scene, and it may not quite have the power in the way we read it today that it did at the time it was written. So let's, let's look for a moment. You've got the story with Philip, and he comes to Nathaniel and says, we found the guy who John was talking about, Jesus of Nazareth. And what does Nathaniel say? In English, it sounds very wimpy. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? That's really tame. But at the time, in the Greek and in the Aramaic, that was a big smackdown. It was insulting. And it was intended to be insulting. And how does Jesus respond to that? He doesn't snap back. What he says is, well, there's an Israelite in whom there's no deceit. It almost sounds approving. It's the modern equivalent of saying, well, there's a guy who tells it like it is. But what was Jesus doing with that? Nathaniel picked up on this immediately. He said, how did you know me? And that's the thing. Jesus doesn't try to come up with some snappy comeback. He just says, I know you. I know who you are. And that cuts Nathaniel to the quick. More than anything else, he gets this is the Son of God because he knows it. More than anything else, he understands God is at work here because he knows him. There's no insult, no anger, just I know you. And then an invitation to come along, to be with him. Those are the words God has given us. We don't need to insult, to belittle, to abuse. That will drive people away from Christ. <clears throat> but when faced with hatred and anger and abuse ourselves, 
We look to Christ who says, I know who you are. I see in you the person God sees. And we invite to come and see. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are beneficial. Words have power. And God has given us words. And those words we are called to use for the kingdom of God and for the love of God. Amen. Amen.